A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm so glad you're with me on the program today. Now, we're going to be setting the record straight here about what happened with the Supreme Court yesterday, uh, declining to grant an emergency injunction that would have halted enforcement of Illinois' ban on uh, the sale of so-called assault weapons, as well as the uh, ban on the sale and possession of, quote-unquote, large-capacity magazines. Now, this is not a decision that uh, any gun owner is happy about, but I don't think that uh, – I've, I've not seen gun owners actually freak out about this. I think most Second Amendment advocates understand that this was, again, asking for some pretty extraordinary relief at a very early stage in the litigation. Uh, and this is not a reflection on what the Supreme Court might think about the constitutionality of a ban on modern sporting rifles. Uh, unfortunately, the mainstream media is running with a very different narrative. And we're going to get to that uh, in just a moment. Before we do, however, uh, let's talk about something else that's going on. You know, when you make choices about where to put your hard-earned dollars, you're supporting not only the company that made the product, but the values and the principles of that organization. It's easier to flip a switch against a company when they blatantly conflict with your values, as we've seen recently. Uh, but do you make an effort to do business with the companies that support what you believe when you can? Do yourself a favor and give my friends at Defender Ammunition a shot. These guys are veteran-owned and operated. Every person on their staff is military-connected. They're huge supporters of the military community, backing causes that are actually making a difference in the lives of those that have served. In fact, the profits from all of their logoed gear – goes directly to the charities that they back. This company is one to support. Their ammo is top-notch. Their customer service is incredible. One of their shipping department writes handwritten thank you notes to their customers. Give Defender Ammunition a try. They've shown us a, a promo code and uh, let us use this and you use this at the end of the month. 5% off your order when you use the code Bearing Arms. B-E-A-R-I-N-G-A-R-M-S. Good for, again, 5% off your order. Trust me, once you give these guys a try, you won't be going anywhere else. Check them out at DefenderAmmunition.com. So, again, look, I was disappointed when the uh, Supreme Court order came out yesterday. Uh, no comment by any judge or justice on the bench, right? Uh, you didn't even see Justice Thomas or Scalia or – just well, you wouldn't have seen Justice Scalia say anything. Justice Thomas or Alito – uh, say, listen, guys, you know, uh, this doesn't have anything to do with the merits of your case. It's just a little early. It was just an, nope, we're not going to intervene at this point. And there are, you know, listen, there were good arguments why the Supreme Court should have intervened at this early stage. But there were also sound reasons why it wasn't likely that the court was going to do so. Uh, and we'll get into those rationales and those reasons. But let's first talk about the spin that the media is putting on the Supreme Court's lack of intervention, at least for now. This is from Newsweek. Conservative Supreme Court justices side with gun control advocates. No, that's not the case. This is from the uh, Huntsville Times. The Supreme Court has done a temporary but significant victory for gun control. I, 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 no, again, only if you believe the anti-gun spin. Oh, and speaking of anti-gun spin, here's how, uh, now granted, this is not, I wouldn't call Salon mainstream. They are a left-leaning uh, or left-wing outfit. But this is how they reported on the Supreme Court's decision. Scott is shocker. Supreme Court refuses to block blue state assault and ban. And then they have a little uh, quote here. The Supreme Court once again reaffirms the rights of legislators and local officials to pass gun safety laws. That a uh, quote, by the way, from a uh, Giffords Senior advisor, a former congressman, Debbie Muscarel Powell, who, uh, who said, quote, this is a great victory for Americans and all of us working to protect our children from the gun violence epidemic facing our nation. With this ruling, the Supreme Court once again reaffirms the rights of legislators and local officials to pass gun safety laws. OK, again, that's not what yesterday's decision by the Supreme Court means at all. Supreme Court did not uphold any gun ban or any magazine ban. It did not rule that any uh, gun ban or magazine ban is unconstitutional. It didn't get involved. 
That's it. It didn't get involved. And again, this would have been the earliest possible opportunity for the court to intervene. As we've already seen in uh, the Antonin case out of New York, that was also a case that uh, kind of went up for this emergency appeal, right? And the Supreme Court denied that appeal. At that point, you had, uh, I believe it was Thomas and Alito who said, listen, this is not based on the merits of the case. Uh, and if the Second Circuit doesn't get attacked together and start dealing with this issue quickly, then we reserve the right to get involved. But they wanted the lower courts to play their role. They did not want to, uh, again, intervene so soon after the Bruin decision was handed down before the lower courts have had a chance to wrestle with the Bruin decision. And I suspect that's exactly what is at play here in the Illinois case as well. So this case that the Supreme Court was asked to uh, to intervene in, a case called Devis versus Naperville, um, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals has declined uh, to issue, again, an emergency stay. But that case is still very much in the early stages of litigation. You also have four other federal challenges to Illinois' gun and magazine ban. Those were heard by U.S. District Judge Stephen McGlynn, who did grant an injunction. And that injunction was halted by Seventh Circuit Judge Frank Easterbrook after, I think, six days. And the Seventh Circuit as a whole has not yet dealt with the Illinois gun and magazine ban. They have uh, agreed to an expedited briefing schedule. They, they are moving things quickly. And I suspect that is the primary reason why the Supreme Court declined to intervene right now, because the Seventh Circuit has said, okay, you know, listen, we know this is a live issue. Uh, we're going to have an expedited briefing schedule. We're going to try to take care of this as you know, quickly as the gears of justice move in this country. And if the Seventh Circuit is doing what the Second Circuit did not, or what at least a couple of the justices uh, as Scotus thought the uh, you know Second Circuit was sort of slow walking this uh, post Bruin litigation, Seventh Circuit appears to be going out of their way to say, "Listen, we're not going to do that. All right, we're not going to delay. We're not going to dawdle," which cuts against the Supreme Court acting right now. But that's not the only reason why the court may be taking a wait and see approach here. The Illinois gun ban case is not the only gun ban case that is pending in the federal judiciary. So out in California, you've got uh, U.S. District Judge Roger Benitez, who is expected to issue a decision in a challenge to California's ban on so-called assault weapons, really at any time. I mean, the oral arguments have been held. Um, I'm kind of surprised we actually haven't seen a decision by uh, Judge Benitez yet. You also have new challenges to the newly enacted gun ban in Washington state. Um, but probably the case that's furthest along in terms of getting up to the Supreme Court in the regular course of business for review is a case out of the Fourth Circuit. A uh, case called, it was originally Bianchi versus Frosch. Now they've got a new attorney general in Maryland, I think, and now it's Bianchi versus Jones. And this is a case that uh, had already gone up to the Fourth Circuit. Fourth Circuit actually said, yeah, Maryland's gun ban, it's fine. Uh, because AR-15s are like machine guns. And since machine guns are protected by the Second Amendment, ah, then semi-automatic firearms uh, like the AR-15 aren't either. It was a bad decision. It was also one that was vacated by the Supreme Court in Bruin, or post-Bruin, when the Supreme Court took four cases and GVR'd them. They granted cert, they vacated the lower court's decision, and they remanded it back to lower court for review. Bianchi was one of those cases. And last December, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, three-judge panel, heard oral arguments about the constitutionality of Maryland's ban uh, in a post-Bruin environment, and the Fourth Circuit has yet to issue their decision. Now, it could be that this three-judge panel says, you know what, we can't resolve these issues. We, we think it needs to be more fully fleshed out, more fully briefed, so we're going to kick this back down to the district court. But based on what I heard listening to the oral arguments last December, I don't think that's likely. It seemed like at least two of the three judges believed that, that they were in a position to decide this case on the merits. And if that is, in fact, what happens, then Bianchi is a heck of a lot closer to getting to the Supreme Court than either the Illinois challenge, the California challenge, the Washington state challenge, 
or any of the other pending uh, challenges to uh, bans and so-called assault weapons that are, you know, slowly winding their way through the court system. It's frustrating for us as gun owners because every day that these laws are on the books, our rights are being deprived. Our rights are being infringed upon. Our rights are being violated. But from the court's perspective, they're looking at this, I, I think, with a very long-term view. Right? Uh, it's not necessarily that uh, the immediacy of the violation is of utmost importance. I, I agree or disagree with this position. I think the belief on the Supreme Court, at least among the conservative wing of the court, is that they're tired of seeing these appeals courts ignore what they've said in Heller and McDonald and Bruin. They want to give the appellate courts the opportunity to do the right thing. And that means they got to give them time to weigh in on these issues. So they don't want to be accused of uh, judicial activism, stepping in and intervening before the Seventh Circuit has had a chance to weigh in. Even if, again, I think the deck is stacked against gun owners in the Seventh Circuit. Well, again, won't deny it's a frustrating development for gun owners, but it is not a sign that the Supreme Court has suddenly turned anti 2A or that any of the six justices uh, in the majority in Bruin have suddenly gone squishy or waffly. Again, we might have our concerns as gun owners, but this is not evidence of that. It is also not a significant win for gun control activists. It was not the Supreme Court endorsing the Illinois gun law or the actions of Illinois lawmakers, despite the claims by Debbie Musgrove Powell of Giffords. That is reading way too much into what the Supreme Court did on Wednesday. Now, I understand exactly why the anti-gun media wants to do this. Again, it behooves them to put this spin on it, right? To say, oh, see, the Supreme Court said there's nothing wrong with these gun bans. So we, well, we, we should go ahead and have more of them. But that's not what the Supreme Court said with its silence. All the court said yesterday was that it was not going to intervene in this case right now. That's it. And again, multiple opportunities for the court to intervene as these gun ban challenges get a little bit further down the road. Again, I think the Fourth Circuit opinion or the Fourth Circuit decision, whenever that comes out in uh, Bianchi, is the most likely vehicle for the court to uh, address this issue and weigh in in what it would consider to be a more timely manner. But uh, yeah, we definitely have to push back as gunners against this anti-gun narrative because it is absolute nonsense and uh, says nothing about the constitutionality of these bans on modern sporting rifles. All right, now that we've set the record straight, let's turn our attention to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. Actually, before we do that, there is something we have to think about and talk about. What is happening with the banks? It is literally crazy. Can you imagine what this is going to do to the retirement savings of America? Now, I want to tell you what I've heard from Augusta Precious Metals. Gold buying is on fire right now because people want gold IRAs to protect their retirement savings. And get this, if you have 100000 plus saved for retirement, Augusta will pay you in pure gold to learn how gold IRAs can protect you. That's a big deal. A pure gold coin for free. Reach out to Augusta Precious Metals today and learn how you can get started with gold. Don't let bank failures get you down. Get this free gold and get some peace of mind. Call Augusta Precious Metals today at 855-222-4997 to learn whether gold can help protect your retirement and get your free gold coin. Again, Augusta Precious Metals, 855-222-4997, 855-222-4997. All right, so let's talk about today's uh, Armed Citizen stories, because I've got two for you. Uh, our good deed of the day, which is a great story as well. Excuse me. And our uh, recidivist report, which is a not great story, but, <clears throat> you know, one that we cover every day because these types of incidents happen all the time in our criminal justice system. Rather than getting tough on violent criminals, they get a slap on the wrist or sit on their way. That was the case for uh, one man uh, on probation out of Cole County, Missouri, now charged with attempted murder in a shooting in Iowa. And as it turns out, the probation that he was on uh, in Missouri, not because he 
you know, ran a red light or uh, even uh, called an old lady a name. Uh, no, uh, Antoine Javoni Tanan Jr. was charged with, well, he pleaded, we don't actually know what he was charged with originally, but he pleaded guilty in September 2019 to a charge of discharging a fireman to a motor vehicle as well as second degree property damage. Those are the charges he pled down to, right? Five-year potential prison sentence for those crimes, but a judge gave Tina five years probation instead. Here we are, less than five years later, and uh, Tina has now been charged with one kind of attempted murder uh, based on a shooting in Clinton, Iowa. The uh, victim thankfully uh, treated for non-life-threatening wounds, but really was just a uh, matter of inches, apparently, between uh, an attempted murder charge and maybe a murder charge. As it turns out, Tienan not only was placed on probation less than five years ago for a crime that carried a potential five-year prison sentence, but he's violated the terms of his probation on multiple occasions. As the Quad City Times reports, um, Tina violated his probation during a hearing on September 13th, 2022, regarding his last probation infraction, he was allowed to continue on probation. So the criminal justice system had Tienan, could have put him behind bars, decided to give him a second chance, right? Just, you know, keep your nose clean, stay out of trouble, and, uh, you know, we'll, this will all be taken care of. But when he didn't keep his nose clean, when he didn't stay out of trouble, when he violated his probation, what happened? The judge said, Carry on. Keep doing what you're doing without any sort of consequence whatsoever. We're just going to keep you on probation. And I'll wag my finger at you. And apparently, Mr. Tienan, that didn't make much of an impact on him. Again, now charged with attempted murder. And now authorities are talking about uh, revoking his probation and sentencing him to that uh, original term in uh, Missouri. Seems kind of like, you know, closing the barn door after the horse has escaped, if you ask me. But... I guess better late than never, but uh, again, <laughs> what does it take to put a violent offender behind bars? Uh, apparently, it takes multiple crimes for multiple years and multiple probationary sentences before that can happen, at least in some jurisdictions. All right, moving on to today's Armed Citizen Stories, plural. We will uh, start with a case out of Illinois where a, a judge has found that a man did not commit first-degree murder and instead was acting in self-defense when he shot and killed a man in 2020. Uh, you know, we had talked earlier uh, in the week at Bearing Arms about a guy in Shelby County, Tennessee, who is currently facing charges of reckless endangerment after he fired back at car thieves who shot at him while he was sitting on his front porch. Um, it doesn't matter how justified you might be in protecting yourself or your family, listen, you can still face charges. You can still go to trial, as was the case for a gentleman named Cody Neuschwanger of Polo, Illinois, uh, who was acquitted of killing Devin Bailey of Oregon, Illinois, in a self-defense shooting back in 2020 in the town of Rochelle. Uh, last Thursday, Neuschwanger found not guilty of four charges of first-degree murder and mob action. According to Rochelle Police, uh, officers were called out to a home on October 29th, 2020, for reports of a shooting. Police say that a man named Devin Bailey taken to a local hospital was pronounced dead. Neuschwanger, according to his defense attorney, was called out to the house to help a woman who was the mother of one of two teens who was also arrested at the time after Devin Bailey became violent and threatening. Michael Johnson, who's Neuschwanger's attorney, said that Bailey had a history of domestic abuse charges. And according to witnesses, Neuschwanger who had previously worked with the Illinois Department of Corrections, had received training in conflict de-escalation, tried to calm Bailey down. He did try to defuse the situation. But when Bailey came at him with a weapon and threatened to kill him, even after Neuschwanger displayed his firearm and said, back up, Bailey did not. He continued approaching, and that is when Neuschwanger fired one shot, which killed Devin Bailey. Uh, Neuschwanger opted for a bench trial, and again, a judge ruled in Neuschwanger's favor, returning a not guilty verdict at that bench trial. So facing first-degree murder charges, Cody Neuschwanger will not be going to prison. He will be heading home because a judge 
found that, uh, again, he was acting in self-defense. Kind of makes you wonder why the local prosecutors charged Newswinger based on the eyewitness testimony. I wasn't in the courtroom, so I don't know what other evidence may have been presented, but man, based on the accounting by uh, WTVO, that sure sounds like it was lawful self-defense all the way. I am uh, glad and grateful for Mr. Newswanger that a uh, judge agrees. Now, our second armed citizen story of the day does not involve the use of a firearm. Instead, it involves the use of a slingshot. On the part of this young man, 13-year-old Owen Burns, who was uh, at home in rural Michigan with his younger sister earlier this month. Younger sister's uh, eight. She's outside playing. Cody's, uh, you know, hanging out. And he sees this guy walk out of the tree line in the backyard and go up to his little sister and grab her. Puts his hand over her mouth. She's screaming and kicking. She actually manages to get away from him. But the guy runs after her. And that's when Cody grabbed his slingshot. And he said, I put a marble in it, put a rock in it, and uh, fired three shots, he said. Uh, hit him in the head and in the chest. That was apparently enough to uh, get the guy to break off his attempted kidnapping and run away. Uh, police were actually able to identify the suspect as a 17-year-old from the area, in part because of the bruises that the uh, slingshot had left on the uh, individual's face and arms. Uh, Alpena Post Commander Lieutenant John Grimshaw said to see Cody Burns or Owen Burns' actions that quickly is extraordinary, and he should be commended for it. Uh, as you can imagine. Owen's parents, also very pleased. Andrew Burns, his dad, said, you know, once it all set in, it hit kind of hard because it could have been a whole different outcome. Thankfully, that wasn't the outcome. Everybody is okay, with the exception of that 17-year-old who's now facing charges. And uh, Owen Burns says he would not hesitate to save his sister again. He says, if it does happen again, I'll do it again. So there you go. Looking out for his little sister, Owen Burns there in Alpena, Michigan. Nice shot, kid. Uh, all right. Finally, today's good deed of the day in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. A police officer in Duluth, Georgia, who ended up saving the life of a little girl on his way to work. Yeah. In this case, the uh, right place and the right time was stuck in traffic on a Monday morning. That's where uh, Officer Andrew Bray found himself. He was on his way to work and he noticed a woman uh, on the side of the road, who was trying to do the Heimlich maneuver on a child. So Andrew Bray got out of his car, ran over, uh, assisted the woman, performed Heimlich, uh, the Heimlich maneuver, and actually was able to dislodge a piece of candy from the uh, little girl's throat. Uh, her parents, Nicole and Jeremy Engelberg, shared their experience on the Duluth Police Department's Facebook page. Jeremy Engelberg wrote uh, in part, quote, so many little moments occur throughout the day. That resulted in our daughter and Officer Bray crossing paths in a time of her greatest need. Now two lives are forever intertwined. Thank you for saving our daughter's life. You are forever a hero. According to Fox 5 in Atlanta, the family say, uh, says that Bray was very humble about their thanks, but, uh, quote, we really just wanted to hug him. And they were able to get that opportunity. The uh, department sharing these photos on their Facebook page. Uh, Officer Andrew Bray again reuniting with the family. Uh, including that little girl, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Officer Andrew Bray with the uh, Duluth, Georgia Police Department, we thank you, sir, for your very, very good deed. Now, that is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam & Company. But I want to thank you, as always, for being a part of today's show. And I would encourage you, check out BearingArms.com, the website, between now and next Monday, because we've got you caught up on all of the latest Second Amendment news and information the good, the bad, and unfortunately, the ugly stuff out there as well. If you like what you see, maybe not, you know, the ugly stuff, but how we're reporting on it. I would also encourage you to become a VIP member. Just go to barryandarms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS, and you can get a significant savings on your VIP membership. As Ari was saying, thanks for showing your support. We're going to give you exclusive content. News stories analysis you won't find anywhere else. My colleague Ryan Petty has a great VIP piece today at Barry and Arms talking about the cut and paste gun control advocacy from on the part of a CNN. That's the type of stuff you're going to get. And he brings the receipts. It is excellent. I encourage you to check it out. And uh, again, 
thank you for showing your support. Looking forward to being back with you soon. Until then, be well, be safe, be free.